Item number SCP-432 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-432 is kept in a standard storage area of Sector 25. It is to be kept locked at all times and the key to the lock kept in an adjacent security station under guard by three Level 3 personnel. No other special containment required. Description. SCP-432 is a two-door steel storage cabinet, measuring 2 meters tall by 1.2 meters wide by 1 meter deep. The exterior of the cabinet is painted matte green, and bears no remarkable features except small areas of corrosion and light scratching commensurate with being left exposed to the elements for a prolonged period of time. The doors of the cabinet are fitted with a basic slide bolt and a hasp for a padlock, allowing the door to be secured from outside. The interior dimensions of SCP-432 display significant disparity with the exterior. The doors open into an apparently extra-dimensional space containing a large labyrinth complex comprised of an as-of-yet uncharted series of corridors. The walls, floors, and ceiling of the corridors are constructed from heavily rusted steel and adhere to the same height and width scales as the exterior of SCP-432, 2 meters high by 1.2 meters wide. The corridors within SCP-432 are lit at irregular intervals by what appears to be regular household light bulbs secured to the walls in wire mesh fittings. Many of the bulbs observed flicker and numerous others are burnt out or broken. In places, several large-gauge steel pipes have been found bolted to the walls of the tunnel. These pipes are notably cold to the touch and contain flowing water, although the source and destination of the pipes and water are unknown. Many of the pipes observed are in obvious need of repair and leak cold, average of 3 degrees Celsius water. Analysis of this water has revealed a low oxygen content and trace amounts of iron oxide, but the water is otherwise potable. The exact size of the labyrinth complex to which SCP-432 connects cannot be accurately measured at each time the doors of the cabinets are closed and then reopened. The entrance created by the cabinet apparently moves to a different section of the maze. The fate of personnel within the maze when the door is closed is unknown, although remains discovered within the maze suggest starvation is the likely outcome. Other remains, coupled with additional evidence gathered during exploration, suggest that the labyrinth contains a large predatory inhabitant of indeterminate species hereafter known as SCP-432-1. GPS units used within SCP-432 are rendered useless, as are cellular phones. Remote control devices in SCP-432 are similarly impaired and cease to function after traveling an average of 20 meters into the maze, rendering remote mapping of the internal layout impossible. High-gain radio transmissions can be used to keep in contact with personnel within the labyrinth, although significant interference occurs deeper into the maze. If the doors of the cabinet are closed, then all forms of contact with personnel within SCP-432 are severed. Additional notes: SCP-432 was discovered in an abandoned industrial complex in United Kingdom. It came to the attention of the Foundation after Dr. T. Small heard reports of several homeless persons in the area disappearing after staying in the complex. Upon investigation, Dr. Small discovered a cabinet at the center of an abandoned steel mill, surrounded by a number of sleeping bags, bags of clothing and other personal effects, suggesting a number of homeless persons had recently made camp there. SCP-432 was unlocked, but the door closed upon discovery. After exploring the immediate area beyond the entrance, Dr. Small exited SCP-432 and summoned Foundation personnel to transport the cabinet to Sector 25 for analysis. Currently, expeditions have been sent into SCP-432 to attempt to chart its internal geography. To date, D-Class personnel have been lost within the maze. No further expeditions may be made without express permission from at least two Level 4 personnel. Paint samples, metal fatigue, and construction techniques date SCP-432 to having been constructed in the early 1950s. However, artifacts recovered from within SCP-432 have been accurately dated to much earlier periods. Expeditions Below are the expeditions within SCP-432 to date. The standard agreed mission equipment pack agreed by Dr. T. Small and Dr. is One hand torch with a three-hour lifespan and additional power source providing up to six additional hours. One headset microphone linked to control, one shoulder mounted video unit set for wireless transmission, 2.5 liter bottles of water, two high calorie energy bars, and eight sticks of luminous marker chalk. SCP 432 Expedition 1 Date Expedition Supervisor Dr. T. Smalls. Subject is D 64502, male, average physique. Subject's background shows history of aggravated assault and burglary. 
Subject is equipped with standard mission equipment pack and sent into SCP-432. Camera is activated and subject enters SCP-432. The door is held open by a 3 kg weight placed inside the doorway, with technicians on hand to remove the weight and close the door if required. Camera activates, showing a short corridor constructed from the same rusted, corroded metal as the exterior of SCP-432. The floor is formed from rich safety steel, as might be found in industrial walkways or gantries. The corridor makes a 90 degree turn to the right approximately 5 meters ahead of the subject. Control asks the subject to move around the corner. Subject moves forward as requested, turn the corner into a longer tunnel. The exact wind's lens cannot be judged due to the lack of lighting. A conventional electric bulb on the wall lights the immediate area, but the light fails to illuminate much beyond 3 meters. Further lights can be observed ahead, though they only illuminate patches of the tunnel. Control instructs the subject to turn on his torch, and the lighting is notably improved to the limit of the torch's beam, approximately 20 meters. Control asks the subject to proceed down the tunnel. After approximately 42 meters, a crossroads appear in the tunnel. D-64502 asks Control which way to go, and Control tells the subject to pick a tunnel. The subject chooses to go left, and before entering the new tunnel, proceeds a stick of marker chalk from the equipment pack and draws a large arrow on the wall, indicating the direction of the exit. As subject moves in the new tunnel, Control notes that video quality has begun to degrade, with visible interference appearing on the monitors. Control does not inform the subject of this. Subject proceeds down new tunnel for 11 meters before tunnel T-junctions left and right. Subject takes the left tunnel, again marking the direction back to the exit with chalk, and continues onward. Subject walks approximately 5 meters down the tunnel, then stops and asks Control if they heard anything. Control replies they did not and asks what D-64502 heard. Subject is quiet as if listening, then replies in muted tones that he can hear someone banging on a wall in the distance and shouting. Subject becomes agitated until Control if the person sounds fucking scared. Control boosts audio gain on the subject's camera and picks up sounds similar to the subject's description. Repetitive distant banging consists of someone striking a metal surface with their arms or hand. A voice can be detected, but audio quality is not sufficient to discern words. Subject is becoming increasingly agitated by the sounds. Control informs the subject to move in the direction of the shouts. The subject objects, but after a short discussion with Control about the nature of his employment, he moves forward. After approximately 14 meters, the tunnel turns 90 degrees right and angles downward in a gentle slope. Video interference is now noticeably increased, and slight audio interference is now audible. Subject has begun breathing heavily and muttering under its breath. Subject continues down the tunnel for approximately 27 meters until the floor levels out again. The subject abruptly stops, crouches, and swears. Control asks why he has stopped. The subject remains quiet, but breathing has become louder and heavier. Control asks again why the subject has stopped, and D-64502 replies he heard a scream, and that the banging and shouting has suddenly stopped. Control informs the subject to stand and move forward, but the subject becomes agitated and demands to be allowed to leave. After several minutes of arguing, the subject stands, takes a long drink from one of the bottles of water, and moves forward again, although slowly. Ahead, the tunnel T-junctions left and right. Control tells the subject to go right. Subject marks the way back to the exit with chalk and goes right. The tunnel ends in a dead end after six meters. Control informs the subject to go back to the junction and take the left tunnel. This too leads in a dead end after only four meters. Subject seems to have calmed slightly and suggests returning to the previous T-junction and trying the other tunnel. Control confers with Doctor, who decides to recall the subject and announce the data collected so far. The subject had been within SCP-432 for exactly 37 minutes at this point. Control informs the subject to return. The subject moves back through the tunnels, following his chalk marks towards the exit. At crossroads, the subject freezes again and asks Control if they heard a noise. Control confirms that they are detecting a sound, but requests D-64502 explain what he is hearing. Subject identifies the noise as wind. At this point, the camera captures a small drift of what appears to be dead leaves blown from the right-hand unexplored tunnel. Subject remarks that the breeze smells stale. Control informs the subject to collect several leaves for analysis and then proceed down the right-hand tunnel to locate their source. Subject collects leads and complains about orders to remain in SCP-432 but moves towards the tunnel mouth. As subject nears the tunnel entrance, a loud echoing roar is heard over the audio, similar to a large animal such as a bear or a lion. Subject panics, screams, and runs for the exit, ignoring Control's demand to investigate the sound. Subject sprints towards the exit and collapses in the storage area. Expedition is aborted, the door closed and locked, and subject removed for debriefing. SCP-432 Expedition 2 Date. Expedition Supervisor Dr. T. Smalls Subject is D-6411, female, 32, average physique. Subject's background shows an incident of attempted murder. Subject is equipped with standard mission equipment pack and sent into SCP-432. 
camera is activated and subject enters SCP-432. The door is held open by a 3 kg weight placed inside the doorway, with technicians on hand to remove the weight and close the door if required. Camera activates showing subject is in a long corridor constructed from the same corroded metal as the exterior of SCP-432. Light from the open door behind the subject, coupled with the illumination provided by the bulbs located at regular intervals on the walls of the structure, lights the tunnel for approximately 20 meters. More lights are visible further down the tunnel, but are very dim. Control requests subject turn on her torch and move into the structure. Subject complies. The passage continues for approximately 100 meters from the entrance until it ends in a T-junction, leading left and right. Subject asks Control which way to go and is told to go right. D-6411 marks the route back to the exit with marker chalk, and proceeds down the tunnel for 50 meters until a crossroads is reached. Control informs subject to take the left-hand branch, and subject marks the tunnel wall and enters the indicated passageway, which is followed for 47 meters until another crossroads is reached. Control notes interference to both the video and audio feeds have begun to appear, but is currently negligible. Subject pauses to drink from one of her bottles of water and marks her route back before selecting, without permission from Control, the right-hand branch. Control admonishes D-6411 but allows her to continue. The passageway makes a 90 degree turn left or to 18 meters, then continues straight for approximately 73 meters. Ahead of the subject appears another crossroad, but as the subject nears it she freezes and reports that she can hear a rhythmic banging coming through the walls. Control boosts audio gain on camera and the sound is picked up. The banging lasts for 73 seconds before it stops. Subject has remained still while listening, attempting to breathe quietly. Control prompts the subject to mark the tunnel wall and proceed left. The subject remains motionless and makes several inquiries into the nature of SCP-432 and the sources of banging. Control firmly reiterates their commands and subject resumes walking, taking the left tunnel as indicated. Subject has traveled for almost 150 meters when she stops and aims the camera at the left wall of the tunnel. She observes that all the light fittings in this stretch of the structure have been broken. Shards of broken bulb are visible scattered across the floor. Subject continues forward, remarking that she has begun to detect a faint, unpleasant odor. When asked to describe said odor, D-6411 replies, something dead. After a further 24 meters, the subject notices an object in the tunnel ahead and moves towards it. Video quality is now beginning to severely degrade. Camera angle tilts as subject kneels to examine the object, and Control asks subject to explain what she has found. Subject explains the object is a left sports shoe, commonly known as a sneaker. The camera zooms in on an object while the subject illuminates it with a light source. Camera view tilts again as subject suddenly looks down at the floor of the tunnel and emits a loud expletive. The floor of the tunnel is covered with a large quantity of dried brown residue that crackles and flakes as the subject moves her feet. Sprays of the residue observed dried onto the walls. The subject remarks that the substance is apparently the source of the odor, and she surmises that it is dried blood. The camera tracks several large smears of the substance leading away from the pool up the corridor. Subject's breathing is becoming slightly panicked. Control requests the subject collect the shoe and a sample of the substance for analysis. Subject does so, although complains continuously about the smell and expresses wishes to exit SCP-432. Her requests are denied and Control orders the subject to continue onwards. Subject continues down the corridor at a much decreased walking speed and is becoming agitated. Camera view changes repeatedly as subject begins looking over his shoulder at erratic intervals. Video and audio feed are beginning to become severe, and Control asks subject to halt while they confer with Dr. Dr. decides to recall the subject, who is now becoming extremely panicked, complaining of hearing footsteps behind a wall to her right. Control boosts audio, but interference prevents confirmation of subject observations. Dr. Confirms the exhibition is over and Control recalls the subject, who begins moving back towards the exit at increasing speed. Subject's egress from SCP-432 is unremarkable except for subject's increasing speed as she nears the exit. Once out of SCP-432, the door is closed and locked and subject sent for debrief. SCP-432 Expedition 4 Date Expedition Supervisor Dr. T. Smalls Team is made up of three members, D-5891, male 27. D-8321, female 32, and technical assistant. Equipment packed for this expedition differs from norm each member carries. One hand torch and a three-hour lifespan with additional power source of running up to six additional hours. One headset microphone linked to control. 2.5 liter bottles of water. Two high-calorie energy bars. Subject D-5891 is equipped with 10 sticks of luminous marker chalk. One 250mm steel rebar. 
Subject D-8321 is equipped with one shoulder-mounted video unit set for wireless transmission. Tentacle Assistant is equipped with one standard-issue Beretta 9mm firearm with 20 rounds of ammunition, one back-mounted oxyacetylene cutting torch. Subjects have been briefed that they are to enter SCP-432, move a short distance of the structure, and then attempt to cut through the interior walls with the oxyacetylene torch. Camera is activated and team enters SCP-432. The door is held open by a 3 kg weight placed inside the doorway, with technicians on hand to remove the weight and close the door if required. Camera activates, showing teams in a long corridor constructed from the same corroded metal as the exterior of SCP-432. Light from the team's torches illuminate the tunnel for approximately 30 meters. The team moves into the structure, with D-5891 marking their progress every few meters with luminous chalk. After several turnings, chosen by control at random, the team arrives at a crossroads. Attached to the wall of the northern passageway are two large steel pipes. The team is asked by control to examine these pipes. Places a hand on one pipe and remarks that it is very cold to the touch and that there is a sensation of liquid moving within the pipe. Request to cut into the pipe, but Control denies the request, informing the team to follow the pipes instead. The team moves north from Crossroad, following the pipes for almost 300 meters, taking several turnings in the process until the pipes continue through the wall of a dead end. Control informs the team that they should ignite the oxyacetylene torch and cut through the dead end. At this point, moves to the fore and lights the torch. D-5891 takes a position behind him with the pry bar ready, and D-8321 moves back to cover the other two with the camera. Cuts into the wall, attempting to excise a hole large enough to step through. As he begins cutting, D-8321 remarks that she believes she heard a noise behind him. The camera angle changes as she looks over her shoulder, revealing the corridor behind the team to be empty. Control requests she turn back and film the cutting has made an approximately one meter high cut into the wall when D-8321 remarks again that she can hear something moving close by and begins looking around. D-5891 and appear not to hear her over the sound of the oxyacetylene torch. Finishes the vertical cut and then proceeds to make a short horizontal cut to allow D-5891 to insert the pry bar and pull out a section of the metal wall. As D-5891 steps forward and inserts the pry bar into the cut, a loud roar is heard, apparently coming from behind the wall. D-8321 screams and begins to back away, at which point the cut section of the wall is seen to bend outwards, pushed by something from behind. At this point, the video feeds become confused, as D-8321 attempts to flee and the camera is unable to compensate for our rapid movements. Audio transmission is also unreliable, due to the interference and screams of the team. It appears that a large indigenous life form comes through the hole cut by and assaults the team. Gunfire can be heard, presumably from sidearm along with screens from D-8321 and D-5891. The audio logs also record a loud bellowing, which is currently unidentified but presumed to be made by the lifeform. Video stills reveal that Subject D-8321 manages to return to the entrance of SCP-432, injured in a state of extreme mental distress. She exits SCP-432 and, before technical staff can stop her, pulls out the weight holding the door open and shuts SCP-432. When the door is reopened, the internal layout has changed and D-5891 and technical assistant are presumed lost. Subject D-8321 is removed for debrief after which she is terminated. During debrief, it is discovered that a large tuft of animal hair is caught in the harness of D-8321's equipment pack. The hair is removed for analysis. SCP-432 Expedition 5 Date Expedition Supervisor Dr. T. Smalls Subject is D-8887 Male, 19, athletic physique. Subject's background shows a history of gang violence and murder. Subject is equipped with standard mission equipment pack and sent into SCP-432. Camera is activated and subject enters SCP-432. The door is held open by a 3 kg weight placed inside the doorway, with technicians on hand to remove the weight and close the door if required. Camera activates, showing subject is in a short corridor constructed from the same corroded metal as the exterior of SCP-432, which terminates in a T-junction after approximately 10 meters. Tunnel is notable to previous expeditions that there are no lit bulbs on the wall. As subject moves forward, he remarks that there is a large quantity of broken glass on the floor of the tunnel. Subject switches on his torch and proceeds towards the T-junction, then proceeds left as instructed by control after marking his route. 
Subject moves through SCP-432 taking turnings as indicated by control. During this time, the subject is careful to mark his route using marker chalk and makes routine reports to control describing any visual or audio impressions of the structure. Subject reports that he can hear occasional distant machine noises through the walls and that the interior of SCP-432 is quite cold. After 45 minutes, subject has traveled approximately 2,500 meters through the structure. Video and audio interference is minimal, and subject has carefully marked his route through SCP-432 with marker chalk. So far, all the wall-mounted light bulbs observed in this section of the structure have been broken. Subject stops to take a drink from a bottle of water and consume a ration bar. After resting for a few minutes, subject continues and, after taking a turning to the right, encounters three objects on the floor of the tunnel. Subject stops and illuminates the objects with his torch, revealing them to be two crumpled food cans of one bent tin fork. The cans are partially corroded and seem to be quite old. The labels are of a familiar brand of canned beans. Control asks the subject to place the items in his equipment pack for analysis. Subject continues onward, but after 40 meters stops and informs Control he can hear something. Control requests clarification, and D-8887 remarks that he can hear a faint sobbing or crying emanating from somewhere nearby. Control asks if the crying is male or female. The subject responds that it sounds male. Audio pickup fails to register the sound clearly. Subject is currently stood at a T-junction. Control instructs D-887 to move in the direction of the crying. Subject takes the left-hand passageway, moves 30 meters down the connected corridor, takes a right turn and follows the corridor another 22 meters, proceeds straight ahead at a crossroads and continues for 37 meters. Video interference has begun to increase, and Control cautions the subject not to proceed too quickly. Subject complains that darkness within SCP-432 is hampering his efforts, then shouts, Hello, can you hear me? I'm coming. Control admonishes D-887 for shouting, informing him he may attract attention to himself. Subject asks, What else is in here, then? But Control informs the subject to continue along its current route and locate the source of the crying. Subject stops at the next junction and pauses to listen. Audio picks up a drawn-out moan or scream, apparently human in origin, after which the crying ceases. Subject swears and asks if they heard the scream, stating it sounded very close. Control asks Subject to proceed forward, and Subject complies, though slowly, attempting to move with as much stealth as possible. After 20 meters, the passageway turns right. Subject moves around the corner cautiously. The camera reveals the passageway ends in a dead end. Subject approaches the wall and places the ear against the metal. Subject backs away from the wall hurriedly, hissing expletives. Control asks what he heard, and Subject whispers, There's something behind the wall. I can hear it crunching on something. Subject makes repeated whispered requests to exit SCP-432 immediately. Control confers with Dr. who agrees to recover the subject. Control confirms the subject may begin retracting his route, which he does so at increased pace. Subject's egress from the structure is uneventful, although Subject keeps looking over his shoulder and requires repeated verbal encouragement from Control to prevent the onset of panic. Subject returns from SCP-432 after a total expedition time of 1 hour and 47 minutes and is sent for debriefing. SCP-432 materials recovered. All documents contained in this file are Class II clearance requiring two signed approvals to access. All the following items have been recovered from within SCP-432 during the expeditions to date. Leaves Discovered in Expedition 1, 12 leaves in total, 3 oak, 4 ash, 2 rowan, and 3 maple leaves. All leaves are dry and crumbling and exhibit signs of extreme age. Footwear Recovered in Expedition 2, a single left sports shoe made from rubber and canvas with the logo on the ankle. The branding and manufacturing style dates the shoe to 1982. The shoe shows sign of heavy use. Frayed laces, worn soles, and scuffed toes, and is caked with a fine layer of earth and rust. Dried blood. Recover in Exhibition 2. Scrapings from a large dried blood stain. Tests have confirmed the blood is human, male, type O positive. The blood is too old and degraded for DNA reconstruction. Animal hair. Recover in Exhibition 4. A large tuft of matted brown animal fur with a large clump of skin cells attached to the roots. The hairs are approximately 13 cm long, stiff and coarse, and smell extremely unpleasant. DNA analysis has placed the creature in the order family, although noticeable irregularities in the DNA profile exist, suggesting food tins and fork. Recover in Exhibition 5. Two crushed and empty cans of baked beans with meatballs and one tin fork. The cans have apparently been opened with a church key type can opener and contents consumed. Dried residue confirms the contents of the cans to have been baked beans with meatballs. 
One can contains traces of human blood mixed with the food sauce, as well as small traces of human tissue. The blood and tissue is mixed with the food sauce in a manner to suggest it was added to the food prior to consumption. The fork is stamped from tin and of a manufacturer and style consistent with 1940s Army-issue mess kits. It is bent and scratched in places as commensurate with extended use. The tines of the fork are covered with dried food sauce consistent with baked beans with meatballs as well as traces of human blood and tissue.